America loses Archie Bunker. Stifle it for a visitorial memorial. Well, well, well. Today we mourn the loss of beloved actor Carol O'Connor. And I haven't been this upset about a celebrity death since I heard that John Lee Hooker had died. But what really pulls my stretch Cunningham is the fact that we never got to thank Carol O'Connor for all he taught us. So thank you, Mr. O'Connor, for showing us through Archie Bunker that racism can be so funny. But only if it's done at the proper time and place. Saturday nights on the CBS Television Network, right time, right place. Tuesday mornings on the fan, wrong time, wrong place. And we have the open letter to prove it. Thank you, A. Bunker, for introducing America to Sally Struthers. So that now we can look back at those All in the Family episodes from the 70s and prove to this new generation that, yes, at one point Sally Struthers was a tight little package. And not always the gigantic Sally the Hut that we know from her charity campaign. Save the children and save the children for dessert. Not to be cruel. But Sally Struthers still gets recognized on the streets today. Unfortunately, it's by Hollywood Squares fans screaming, Look, it's Bruce Valanche. From what I understand, though, Archie's little girl Gloria is said to be devastated by this loss. Apparently, she found out there won't be a buffet after the funeral. And finally, Archie Bunker, thank you for teaching us when to wrap up a successful TV series at just the right time by not doing it yourself. Honestly, Archie, you should have called it quits sometime after baby Joey was born and sometime before Frank and Irene Lorenzo moved in. Stephanie the niece was a nice touch until Archie Bunker's place. Then all of a sudden, Edith was gone and this old guy was living with a young girl sprouting into womanhood. And it all takes place in a bar. No wonder America turned the channel to Mork and Mindy. It seemed like a more normal relationship. But you know, this whole thing reminds me of growing up in Pinellas Park, Florida, at 704 Hauser Street. It was there that I learned what a huge hit All in the Family was. I remember one night after the episode where Archie was saved by transvestite Beverly LaSalle, my personal favorite. Mother had gone out to the barn with our handyman named Bobo. There, they apparently got into an argument about their favorite AITF characters. That stands for All in the Family. And I guess Mother's was Mike Stivick, because Bobo kept asking her, Do you like the meathead? And you want that meathead, don't you? And check out this meathead. And wait a minute. Sweet goodness, he was not talking about the legendary Rob Reiner. <sighs> Anywho, Carol O'Connor, thanks for Archie Bunker. Thanks for teaching us the word dingbat. And thanks for at least trying on that Heat of the Night show. But now all that's left is the goodbyes. So good night, shoe booty. And remember, we're here, we're queer, we will not disappear. This has been my Fesitorial Memorial. Thank you. Lizzie Grubman runs over 16 people. Hey, Grubby, put it in park for a Fesitorio. Well, well, well. Publicity princess Lizzie Grubman throws her SUV into reverse and runs over 16 people outside a bar. And I haven't seen anyone back into this many people since the time I auditioned for the role of Prison Bitch Number 2 on the hit HBO series Oz. But what really butters my love biscuit is the casual attitude with which this crime is being handled. Lizzie clobbers 16 people with her SUV, or as she calls it, her F-U-V. She flees the scene and is allowed to turn herself in at her earliest convenience and then is freed after posting only $25,000 bail. In the meantime, Paula Poundstone is arrested in the night and has to post a $200,000 bond just for kissing her daughter goodnight. Sure, it was a French kiss goodnight. And yes, it was done under the nightgown. And okay, it lasted 20 minutes. But at least no one was almost killed. And now Lizzie Grubman's defenders are saying we don't know how nice she really is. Big deal. She could be delivering meals on wheels. She's still not allowed to run over people doing it. Besides, how do we know Lizzie Grubman has always been so nice? As a kid, she probably backed her big wheel into a bunch of first graders waiting at a lemonade stand. Lizzie claims that this was all an accident. Well, I've seen her face on TV, and I can understand if she didn't want to look in the rearview mirror. When I first saw that mug, I thought, wow, Mattel has finally put out 
alcohol poisoning Barbie. Not to be cruel, but when Lizzie's attorney claims she's getting a lot of sympathy, I'm sure it's only from people confusing her with Greg Allman, and they're offering their condolences on the loss of his brother Dwayne. But you know, this whole thing reminds me of growing up in Pinellas Park, Florida, where we didn't have a lot of indoor plumbing, so our biggest crime wasn't hit and run, but something that rhymes with it. But it was there that I discovered how serious these types of driving incidents are. I remember Mother organizing a meeting of bad drivers in our barn one night with our handyman named Bobo. Bobo had brought over 15 of his friends who were all horrible drivers. In fact, by the end of the night, I overheard every one of them saying they had rear-ended Mother. One after another claimed to have slammed her from behind. The last one must have even hit our pet mule because he said he had to use a donkey punch on her at... Wait a minute. So when she was on her knees, they weren't holding her head to adjust her whiplash. <sighs> Anywho, when it comes to Lizzie Grubman, we can't let her do whatever she wants just because she has money. First, it's running down patrons at a Hamptons night spot. What's next? Bombing sacks because they didn't have a dress in her size? Remember the last time a privileged rich girl was allowed to run amok? Now she owns ECW, and it appears there's no stopping Stephanie McMahon Helmsley. Let's not let it happen again. It's time we put our foot down and told these social princesses that we're here, we're queer, we will not disappear. This has been my Fezzatoria. you? An open letter from Fez Marie Watley to his mother. Dear Mother, just wanted to take a few moments to thank you. To thank you for all you've done for me. Thank you, Mother, for your little reminders, especially for reminding me constantly of how long and torturous my birth was for you and how a back alley abortion would have been a lot simpler and a lot less painful. Thank you, Mother, for all the male role models you provided for me, especially when Father was out of town. Oh, one male role model after another came through our back door during the night. One child should never have been so blessed by having so many new uncles. And thanks so much, Mother, for providing balanced meals. Not a breakfast, lunch, or dinner went by without some form of of chocolate. Again, my entire five foot four, nearly 350 pound frame thanks you. And thank you, Mother, for letting me know things were okay. Like telling me it was all right to go skinny dipping with the scoutmaster, Mr. Higgins, who lived down the lane. You were right again, Mom. He showed me every inch of what it's like to be a man. Thank you for teaching me object lessons. Like when you use that whiskey bottle to break that baby bird's neck to show me that flying really is not safe. Or playing the song Ode to Billy Joe by the legendary Bobby Gentry over and over again in order to develop in me a healthy respect and terrorizing fear of bridges. Thank you for teaching me about love, mother, by sending me out into the yard with a bucket of cold water every time our beagles felt amorous. I still use things I learned from those beagles today. Thank you, mother, for my social skills. My, how I learned to get along with the other boys who had cool lunch boxes like Star Wars, Dukes of Hazard, or Sheriff Lobo. Well, I was provided a Barbara Mandrell and the Mandrell sisters lunchbox to carry my lunch in, a lunch that consisted of leftover hors d'oeuvres that you had swiped from a happy hour buffet the evening before. And finally, Mother, thank you so much, and most of all, for not coddling to any of my emotional needs and not bogging me down with a lot of affection. So much so that now, any human touch literally feels like hot acid ripping through my skin. Thank you again, Mother, and goodbye. The U.S. against Iraq. First, let's bomb them with a visitorio. Well, well, well. President Bush is looking for support to do an Iraq attack on Saddam Hussein. And I haven't seen America ready to go after someone with a braid and mustache this bad since the media frenzy surrounding Monica Lewinsky. Although Saddam's a little less jolly. But what really scuds my missile is the fact that the president feels he needs to justify going after dickless in the desert, Saddam Hussein, when he's already got every reason to go after Iraq. Reason number one, 
they suck. Seriously, this is a country that is always trying to buy and build weapons of mass destruction. I'm sure Saddam Hussein is constantly calling information looking for the number of an anthrax store. He mowed lawns this summer trying to save money to buy a nuke. And if Saddam sent away for sea monkeys, it would only be because he thought he could turn them into an army of super sea monkey soldiers. Ass face. And Sodom loves chemical weapons, too. The man's probably spent years and millions of dollars trying to come up with the perfect deadly mix of Coca-Cola and Pop Rocks. Brainiac. Reason number two. Saddam Hussein in the membrane has a history of torturing dissidents, invading Kuwait, which, by the way, Kuwait, must make you the mongoloid of the Middle East. How did you get taken over by Iraq? Was their goat bigger than yours? Is it because they wear pants instead of fitted sheets? Tell me how Iraq won this battle of the jobbers. Also, Saddam has put thousands of Kurds to death. Now, I'm not exactly sure what a Kurd is, but I would imagine it's a lot like a Smurf. And people, that's just wrong. And reason number three, Saddam Hussein himself, the guy who put the dick in dictator, has the nerve to call himself a president. Iraq could actually take lessons from Florida on how to run an election. That's how effed up they are. It's not an election, Saddam, when the only name on the ballot begins with who and ends in saying. That's no choice at all. It's like asking kids what kind of ice cream they want, chocolate or spanking. Not to mention, Sodom, how stupid you look walking around in an army uniform. There's nothing more pathetic than a guy squeezing into a uniform he's too old for. It's like Iraq is being run by Don Zimmer. It's like Barney Fife is the butcher of Baghdad. It's like one of those old scoutmasters that still wears the short pants, shirt, and neckerchief and really gives you the creeps. F idiot. But you know, this whole thing reminds me of growing up in Pinellas Park, Florida, where Baghdad is what we called father after we caught him walking the streets posing as a bag lady. But it was there that I learned how people were affected by Saddam Hussein. I remember mother discussing this out in our barn with our handyman named Boo Boo. Apparently, Boo Boo was really influenced by Saddam. I believe he was even following his teachings because he said he was really into Saddam me. And he hoped mother was into sodomy too. In fact, he said if mother was into sodomy, he would really get behind her. And I think, wait a minute. Mama was like a camel. She got humped. <sighs> Anywho, Saddam Hussein, we've got every reason to turn your country into our latest super Walmart. Our president doesn't need to ask anyone's permission, except maybe his dad's. But Saddam, time is running out for you. If you don't believe me, check your what. It's on the hand you don't wipe with. And soon, we'll be partying like it's 1991. Again, you'll be hearing the sweet sounds of our smart bombs and all of America saying, We're here, we're queer, we will not disappear. This has been my visitorial. Hey! Thank you. Good has triumphed over evil. It's the return of a fezzatorial. Well, well, well. Lower management here has finally tapped out and given us a new jump person, thus reinstating the fezzatorial. And I haven't been this thrilled to have something returned since my 16th birthday. And a boy named Jake got my undies back from a geek who charged his friends a dollar to see them. At night, we sat on his dining room table eating cake. But that's another story. But what really bugs my bum is the weeks it took to settle this thanks to the bullying tactics of a certain junior executive. Not to name names, but I mean you, Assistant Program Director Craig Schwab. Mr. Schwab, your reign of terror here is over. No longer will I or the other members of this air staff live in fear of you. We have our new dump person, and until the Bronx Zoo realizes there's a monkey missing, we'll have him for a while. But our victory is just the beginning, Craig Schwab. Eventually, all your cruel policies will fall. The mandatory early morning calisthenics, which almost killed poor Eddie Trunk. The pop quizzes on emergency broadcast system procedures. And, of course, your surprise jock inspections. For years, Craig Schwab, you've told us that around here, your Senator Bob Carey and the rest of us are just a bunch of old Vietnamese women. And for a long time, I thought that was a good thing. Well, no more. And today, Mr. Craig, Senator Carey, Schwab, we all start saying no to you. The sports guys say no. They won't cover figure skating, even though you insist on starting every hour with a Scott Hamilton update. The man's retired, for heaven's sake. And no, Craig Schwab, despite your demands, a 
Black Knights will not, as you put it, tighten up his act on the Radio Chick Show. No matter how hard you lean on Opie and Anthony, they are taking a stand and not allowing you, Craig, to be a contestant in the whipped cream bikini contest. And no more will you be allowed to eat a half a dozen chalupas, take a microphone into the bathroom, and produce Don and Mike's secret sound. No more, Craig Schwab. But you know, this whole thing reminds me of growing up in Pinellas Park, Florida. Or as Craig Schwab calls it, when he's got me up against the lockers, that place he's going to send me back to in a box. But it was there that I learned about employee-boss relations. I remember Mother having all kinds of labor disputes with our handyman named Bobo. They were always going out to the barn to negotiate. And even though they would try to top each other, Mother was willing to compromise. Sometimes I'd hear her say she wanted him on top. Other times, she wanted to be on top. But Bobo knew she was the boss. Because several times she wanted him behind her. And then... Wait a minute. Okay. So that's what she meant when she said her employees always come first. <sighs> Anywho. Assistant Program Director Craig Schwab, you sit there behind your big fancy desk. That card table you put right next to the copy machine. And you bark out your orders. Because now our staff is united like a family. From our big brothers, Opie and Anthony, to Blaine. Who's more like a retarded cousin you only see at family picnics. But united nonetheless to let you know, Craig Schwab, that we're here, we're queer, we will not disappear. This has been my fuzzatorial. Thank you.